Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Near Davie in Broward County in Florida, my brother, I, and a friend were hiking in an old cow pasture that was very overgrown. Davy still had lots of wood and overgrown orange groves back then. Sure, I had heard of the skunk ape, but was never concerned. Being a boy, I was adventurous. Anyway, we were in the pasture hiking when we found an old tractor trailer. The trailer's doors were missing. They were off and lying rotten on the ground, with trees growing in them. We noticed that the trailer smelled real bad. We decided to climb in and look around. All we found was a stench like an animal lived there. We were too far from the road for a bum to wander in, and there wasn't any sign that anyone kept the place up. We lost interest in the trailer and started to hike some more. We came upon a canal that forked with another. To make a long story shorter, I saw something looking at us from across the canal. We were still about 50 yards from the edge of the canal at this point. Whatever it was didn't take notice of us right away, but as we got closer, it looked up and raised its arms above its head as if it was waving at us. This area was very overgrown, and all of my previous trips, I had not seen anyone out there. Whatever this was scared us all so bad, we ran all the way home locked the door, and didn't return to that area until a few years later. My brother now says that we were imagining it. I thought that this was a snake bird, you know, the ones that sit on a post and spread their wings to dry. However, I keep replaying the incident in my mind, and I don't see a snake bird. There was a humanoid head, and the colors were all wrong. Snake birds are usually blackish. What I saw was more brown. I'd only heard stories of skunk apes. Some people swore the big hairy ape lived in the woods off Davy. I was a firefighter there, and I know there were monkeys in the woods, but what I saw was bigger. P.S. About ten years later, an old-timer told me about a creature he saw that crossed in front of his car on Old Griffin Road near U.S. 27. He described the creature as a Bigfoot and said it scared the life out of him. It was mid-morning. The area was a cow pasture bordered on two sides by an orange grove. The pasture was over three miles long, just a mile north or south of New River and Orange Drive, possibly a mile east of Hiatus Road. On to the next one. Near Naples in Collier County in Florida. I went way back in the swamp and woods in Naples off the Floridian Avenue where I lived and we came across a metal cage trap. A tall trap, if you go in and touch the meat at the door, it will slam behind you. I wondered about the trap. I knew there wasn't any bear in the area, but we were around the cage and that's when we heard a loud kind of roar. We ran out of the swamp and told my mom and she wanted to go back there, but I was trying not to. There were three witnesses walking around. It was two in the afternoon back in the swamp. It's a sandy palmetto brush kind of area and kind of swampy creek bottom not too far. On to the next one. In Sarasota County in Florida, me, my brother, and our cousin, 10, 11, and 12 years old at the time, we used to frequent a neighborhood across from ours called Acorn Circle. It was a heavily wooded area that only had about three homes at the time. On the southeast side of this neighborhood, there were no homes at all and was especially a favorite spot of ours to play since it had a few curiosities about the area. Just to describe the location a bit, it is wooded area, had a nice canopy of trees and was somewhat darkened even in the bright daylight. There was this large mound of eroded dirt 
that had a patch of sunlight directly coming through the tree canopy. About 15 feet away, there was a large drainage ditch that was about 5 feet across and 4 feet deep. Someone at the time had placed a log across the ditch in order to cross it. On the other side, there was an old Volkswagen bug and van that had been there so long that the small trees were actually growing up and through them. Further back from this was the scarce remnant of a burned-down house. We rarely explored back further than this due to the increasing darkness, heavy foliage, and swampiness. On the day the sighting occurred, my cousin and myself were playing on the dirt mound with our matchbox cars while my brother explored just a short distance away to the left of us and the Volkswagen. Suddenly, we were jolted to the sound of a loud crack as if someone had stepped on a stick. We immediately looked in the direction of the Volkswagen where the sound came from. There, approximately 10 feet to the right of them, was a large human-like figure. I roughly estimated that it was around 7 feet tall. Its color was not really distinguishable due to the poor lighting. Its right side was slightly obscured by some small trees on the bank of the ditch. We stared at it for about a minute or so, and then started conversing with each other, wondering who or what this thing was that was just standing there watching us. I remember one of us supposing it was a bear standing up, but that was quickly batted down since its shoulders were clearly visible. It simply looked like a large, hairy man. None of us recall seeing a face or any other clear details, considering that all that was really visible was a jagged, hairy silhouette against the dimly lit wood. At one point, I remember saying, I bet it's Bobby, an older teenager that lived in the neighborhood, trying to scare us. I shouted, Hey Bobby, stop playing around, we know it's you, but no response. Then one of us yelled out, Okay, okay, you can come out now, stop trying to scare us, whoever you are. Again, no response. As we continued to stare, it slowly moved slightly to its left, fully exposing itself from behind that small clump of trees. As it moved, it raised its left hand up and outward in order to grab a tree branch while at the same time leaning forward as if to get a better look at us. My brother said that when it did that from his particular angle, he could see long hair dangling from its arms. At this point, we all ran as fast as we could and have never returned. It was mid-afternoon and was a bright and sunny day in a densely wooded area, swampy in some spots. On to the next one. In Lake County in Florida, police think mystery footprints are fake. Altoona, Florida. Most investigators figure it's a hoax, but there is enough doubt in their mind to order cast made of the size 18 footprint found in a remote area of the Ocala National Forest. I think it's a hoax, said Doug Sewell, chief investigator for the Lake County Sheriff's Department. There was no indication that something big enough to make those prints went back through the woods. Less sure, however, is Lake County Sergeant D. Kirby called out to make calf of the half dozen 17 inch by six and a half inch footprints found near a bulldozer in the vicinity of Camp Ocala, a federal job training site. He said the print showed a definite arcing of the instep, five distinct toes, and even some wrinkle along the instep. The print had a full four feet of distance between each one, he said, speculating that if they were real, the creature that made them must be 10 to 12 feet tall and weigh close to 1,000 pounds. The prints were discovered by a private contractor doing road work for the U.S. Forestry Service. Forestry officials also made casts of the prints, but doubted if they would investigate further. Informal speculation centered on whether the creature was the infamous skunk ape, Florida's own version of Bigfoot, and the abominable snowman, reportedly last sighted in the Everglades. On to the next one. My grandpa and I were fishing on Stony Creek one afternoon. People fished there for pike, walleye, 
smallmouth bath, perch, bluegill, and crappie. It was growing dark when we looked over toward the south end and saw a tall, hairy man-like something eating what we believe was a squirrel or rabbit. Once it noticed us, it went into the water, leaping at least 15 feet in the air. It was huge and covered in dark fur. After a short while, we felt taps under our john boat, then something started rocking the boat, and there weren't any other boats making waves around us. The bank area is rocky and flat land. My grandfather talked to an official at the park about this, but all they suggested was that no bears were in the area, so they don't know what we saw. My grandpa said it was probably some guy in a costume, but no man can do what that thing was doing or swim underwater that far. I will never go to that lake again. On to the next one. In Baraga County, Michigan, we were scouting for bear hunting, looking for likely blind location and find. We had walked in from a trailhead two or three miles over very rough terrain. While crossing a blown-out beaver dam, we observed three sets of very fresh tracks in mud. The largest were 15 to 16 inches in length, while the two smaller sets were 8 to 10 inches. The mud was newly exposed, quite soft, and would have filled in quickly if tracks were more than a few hours old. This is a very isolated area. The nearest year-round maintained road is 10 miles away, and it is a gravel road. The tracks were very defined and had very long strides, four plus feet for the larger tracks. The surrounding area was a series of steep rock ridges and hills with a small stream heavily dammed by beavers winding through. You could see where the tracks left the mud and climbed the hill, and it was in an area that would be extremely difficult to walk due to the steepness and loose rocks. This entire incident left my friend and I both quite shaken, and we left the area as quickly as possible. No other sightings or incidents occurred, but we had noticed a distinct feeling of being observed shortly before seeing the tracks, and this had never been felt by either of us before, even though both of us had seen bear and other wildlife many times. We had just strange feelings of being watched. This was very disconcerting due to the distance we were from our truck. We were looking for bear tracks in mud of recently exposed pond bottom. The area is dense forest of spruce, pine, and some hardwood. The area is very isolated and rugged, with steep hills and cliffs to 500 feet above valleys. This is some of the remote land you will find in the lower 48. It is likely there are not 10 homes within 20 miles in any direction. The only roads in the general area are dirt logging roads, and most are impassable due to non-use. On to the next one. In Benzie County in Michigan, my younger sister and I were on our way back from the hospital. She was about 20 years old. I was 23. It was probably around 2 or 3 a.m. when we finally hit County Line Road, outside of where my mother lived. We were both staying with her at the time of the sighting. My mother lives in Buckley, about six miles down Country Line Road. Once you turn off the main highway, we were about half a mile or so down Country Lane Road when we were talking, making jokes. We were both very tired. I turned to say something to her, and when we both looked back straight ahead on the road ahead, I saw a tall thing literally take two steps, and it was across the road. It stood approximately seven or eight feet tall. My husband at the time was six foot five, so it was easier to make out the difference. As soon as we saw it, we both jumped and said, Did you see that? We immediately knew what we both saw and I raced back to my mom's house. Once we were back home, we recalled the details. We were finishing each other's sentences, which was very disturbing, knowing we recollected the same thing. 
It still seems funny to think about, but the thing had long, flowing fur. It actually looked groomed. The hair was all over its body, and it was brownish with silverish tips. The arms were very long and hung down just above its knees. The head was hunched down, and we did not see the face. We laugh about it now and still get chills, especially when we both recall how the thing was walking like it had some place to be. It was the strangest thing. We both agreed that it was walking in haste, not as if it were trying to get away from something or some place. Rather, almost like a person would walk hastily on a city street when they are late for a job or an appointment or something like that. In and around the same area, just down the short drive off Country Line Road, an elderly man and a woman lived in a small house off the same drive. I don't think I was living with my mother at the time of this alleged incident, but as I recall, it wasn't too long after our sighting. My husband and I went for a visit to my mother's home, and my mother told me the man down the road was just beginning to head down Country Line Road, going back toward the way we were coming when we had our sighting. The story was, he was just starting to pick up speed, and he was alone in his truck during the day when he had to slow down, because he noticed something crouched down in the road. He had to eventually come to a complete stop when the animal turned and looked at him and proceeded to run off down the ditch and into the wood. The description of it was that it had hair all over its body, it had a puggish nose, and the chest was more bare. They said he was saying it probably stood about seven feet tall. We have had a lot of strange happenings in this area, even other than these sorts of sightings. I once asked a gas station attendant in the Kingsley area about it not long after my sighting, and he laughed and said, that's nothing new. It was at nighttime, and it was clear. On to the next one. In Alpena County in Michigan, it was on a 150-acre private property mostly wooded with small section five acre being clear cut at about every five years. Bound by mostly farmland, heavy swamp, only three quarters of a mile from Thunder Bay River. While bird hunting with my son, we heard a rustle. As any bird hunter, the gun came up, but I expected because of the sound to see a deer startled from sleep. Instead, I glimpsed something quickly moving between the trees about eight feet apart, over the ferns, and barely below the lowest tree line. Admittingly, this couldn't have been for more than three seconds. This was a very quiet day with very little breeze. It wasn't so much what I saw, but what I heard. If I was deaf, I could dismiss it as a human trespasser. It was all dark brown, about seven feet tall, and running extremely fast, given the original startle silently through the ferns, branches, and sparse deadfall. It was not a bear. I was not a believer of Bigfoot at the time. I told myself it was a deer leaping because of the silence and upright position that covered about 11 yards. Acceptable, right? I looked down at my son and saw nothing but pure white fear in his face. Nothing odd at this location that I've ever heard stories of. Please note. I was not a believer of Bigfoot then. My son's facial expression could only be topped by my own. I was scared of the unknown. I've come to terms with what I saw. It wasn't a bear, deer, or trespasser. Through my years of hunting and fishing, I've seen many creatures, but many elude me. I've only once seen a wild bear. It happened across the highway. Only once have I seen a bobcat. I was strolling through some purchasable land. If I don't see these animals while motionlessly sitting in a tree blind, how many others haven't I seen? I questioned my son as soon as I could talk, my mind still trying to convince myself, my body shaking, and my speech obviously stuttered. He heard the original stir, but couldn't pinpoint it after because of silence. He did not see what I saw. His fear apparently came from the look on my face. He was nine years old. We've hunted together several times, 
and, of course, he knows me enough to know something was wrong. This 160 covers swamp, clear-cut, small field, and old forest. The sighting was 180 yards from the field, 150 yards from the cut, and 50 yards from a very mild swamp in old wood with new growth. We were on a four-wheeler path about 60 yards away from the subject. On to the next one. In the area east of Thomas Bay in Alaska during 1900, there were numerous reports of hairy wild men seen by several independent witnesses. On one occasion, a group of hair-covered creatures ran at a prospector who had climbed a tree to get his bearings. They appeared sexless, and their bodies were covered in long, coarse hair, except where scabs and running sores replaced it. The witness described them as hideous, and eventually escaped to his canoe. Other witnesses described them as neither men nor monkeys, though they were smaller than men. A rather vicious hairy humanoid was seen at Kolaka near Nolato in Alaska in 1920. This creature attacked Albert Petka on his boat, and though his dogs drove the Bushmen away, Mr. Petka later died of his injuries. A hairy humanoid was also seen at Kalukak in Alaska in 1940. There are more. Other sources refer to it as the Kaluka and state that a female hairy humanoid was captured and fed raw fish. The creature's hair then fell out and it died. Also in 1940, at Nalato, Miss Naughty saw large, human-like tracks where she had seen what she thought was a bear swimming across a slough. Still, in 1940, near the ghost town of Kaluka on Bristol Bay, in Alaska, Emily Supanich's mother was berry picking with others when they came upon a large, hairy creature that resembled a man covered in long black hair. She ran back to the village and told the others. It was reported that men went out and captured and caged it. They fed it raw fish. After some time, its hair started to fall out and they realized that it was a female with breasts that soon died. In 1942, Bob Titmus saw an ape-like thing on a beach whilst passing in a boat. It was seven feet tall, very heavy, erect, and had dark hair. This was in the Wrangell Narrows before 10 p.m. in the evening whilst it was still light. Sometime during 1943, at DeWild's camp near Ruby in Yukon, Kuyukuk in Alaska, Mr. John Meyer, also referred to as John McGuire, also known as the Dutchman, claimed that he had been attacked by a bushman, but that his dog had chased it away. Mr. Moss had gone to the nearest village by boat and told his story. It is reported that he died shortly afterward of internal bleeding caused by this attack. This is two deaths by Bigfoot in Alaska so far. In Portlock in Alaska in 1949, there were reports from a teacher and his wife at English Bay that hunters from Portlock sometimes failed to return from their hunts. In 1949, the hunters had been found mutilated. Giant man-like tracks were found that were 18 inches long, closing in on moose tracks and the signs of a struggle. Then there were only deeper man-like tracks heading for higher mountains. The village was abandoned in 1949. About 50 miles southwest of Ketchikan in Alaska, in August of 1956, on the Indian Passage, a fishing boat being anchored at night, Bob Everett saw a bear on shore sitting on its rump. It got up, looked at the boat, 
a few seconds and then started to walk away upright like a human. It went into the woods. It was approximately 200 feet away and estimated about 7 to 8 feet tall and maybe weighed 350 to 400 pounds. Its color was described as blackish-reddish with hair about 2 to 4 inches long. An unnamed biologist from Ketchikan later found and photographed big human-like tracks on the beach. In Yukon and Galena in Alaska, in July of 1968, a tall, hairy humanoid was seen north of Hyder, Alaska, during August of 1968. Two men stopped to shoot what they thought was a bear. It was a Bigfoot that walked off uphill on two legs. Considering that Hyder is only 3.5 kilometers from Stewart, where we had an earlier sighting of a Bigfoot, as well as this month, was it the same one? Bears generally walk long distances on all fours. Locals in Alaska in this period were probably very proficient at recognizing what was a bear and what was not. On the Yukon River near Galena in Alaska, Hazel Stratusberg saw a Bigfoot on the riverbank at dusk in 1968. There were other Bigfoot sightings in the area that year as well. On the Bradfield Canal in Wrangell in Alaska during July of 1969, a hairy humanoid was seen by J.W. Huff and a companion who had just set up camp. The creature was watching them from 500 yards away. It was not a bear. Near Nolato on the Koyukuk River near Ruby in Alaska during autumn of 1970, Patty Nolnar and six other Nolato villagers were trapping muskrat 20 miles up the river from its confluence with the Yukon. They were lying around a fire when suddenly a large rock was thrown at them. The men fired back. Certainly, it was a hairy humanoid attacking them. They threw their gear into their boat and rapidly left. I don't belong to any UFO groups or anything like that, but this actually happened to me. I've told a few trusted friends about it, but never bothered to write it down. I'll try to relate it as accurately as memory allows. In 1990, while I was working as a paramedic in Anchorage, we got called out on an alarm for a man having a heart attack at the state jail in Eagle River. He was a native man in his 70s, and after I got him stabilized with IVs, O2, and cardiac drugs, my partner and I began to transport him to the native hospital in Anchorage. En route to the hospital, I had time to talk to the gentleman who was an Aleut from the native village of Port Graham, a remote village on the lower end of Cook Inlet. Well, as usual with me, the topic eventually drifted to hunting and fishing, and I casually mentioned to him that I and two other hunting buddies were once weathered in at the upper lagoon of Dogfish Bay, only a few miles from his home in Port Graham. The lagoon was about as beautiful and wild a place I've ever seen in my 35 years in Alaska. Well, when I said that I had spent some time in Dogfish, this old man sat up on the gurney and grabbed me by the front of the shirt. He got right up to my face and said, Did it bother you? Well, with that question, the hair just stood up on the back of my head. I said, yes. Did you see it? Was his next question. I said, no. Did you see it? He said, no, but my brother's seen it. It chased him. This old Aleut and I were talking about the same thing, but we never used the word Bigfoot or legend or anything like that. But we both knew what we were talking about. You see, in August of 1973, three of us were bow hunting for goats and blackies 
in what was then the remote wilderness of the lower Cook Inlet, when a storm forced us to take shelter in Dogfish Bay Lagoon. We beached our skiff and let the tide run her dry. After a dinner of broiled salmon, we turned into our tent. Back in those days, the best tent I had was a dark green canvas job with a center pole and no windows or floor. We left the fire burning and cleaned the pot and pan so as to not attract bears during the night, and turned in. The sky was clear, but the wind was howling through the old-growth timber that lined the shore. Sometime around 2 a.m., my friend Dennis woke me up by squeezing my leg. I could dimly see his face in the tent. His finger was across his lips. I listened. Then I heard it. A step. A man was quietly walking outside our tent, taking very deliberate steps. Not a bear. Scenes from the movie Deliverance flashed through my mind. We woke Joe, the third member of our party, with the same leg grab and finger to the lip. The walking, or rather sneaking, continued until it half-circled our tent, and then all was quiet, except for the wind. We had our bows, and the six leaning against the tree outside of the tent, so somehow we talked Joe into belly crawling out the tent to get the rifle. We were scared shitless, I tell you. The next day and night, the storm continued to blow. We saw several black bears on the salmon stream at the head of the lagoon during the evening hunt, but had no chance for a shot. We didn't talk about what had happened that last night. Too embarrassed, I guess, to be scared by a black bear that sounded like a man. We got back to camp early, built a big fire, sat around it, and ate dinner until around midnight. In August, there was still some light in the sky until about 10 or 11. I recall that we were all embarrassed about being afraid about the coming night. We had a flashlight and the rifle in the tent between us, locked and loaded. I finally dozed off, but woke right up when Dennis squeezed my leg. The illuminated hands of my watch showed it was 2.30. Joe was already sitting up and had the rifle in hand. I heard the first step, not more than about 10 feet from the back of the tent, slowly, then another and another. Whatever this was, it sounded like it was walking on two feet. It made the same semicircle around the tent. When we finally got enough courage to crawl out of the tent and turn the flashlight on, we saw nothing. No tracks, nothing. The third night, we decided if it bothered us again, we would come out of the tent shooting. We were actually scared. It never came back the third night. And the following day, we had a break in the weather and got the heck out of there. Never told anybody about the experience for several years until about 1979 when I happened to be reading an old Alaska sportsman magazine published in 1935. In the letters to the editor, a woman wrote that she recently found a letter written by some distant relatives of her who was a school teacher at the cannery in Portlock Bay, a rugged fjord adjacent to Dogfish Bay. The year was 1905. She quoted from the letter, it said that the cannery employed a small group of Aleuts from a small village in Portlock Bay during salmon season. Their camp was about a mile from the cannery building. One day, all the Aleuts moved out of the village and paddled their bidarkas back to Port Graham. The letter says the Aleuts claimed that a hairy man was bothering and frightening them to the point where they had to leave. I have since done some research into the subject and found written in histories of natives from Seldovia to Port Graham being frightened and bothered by something. They even have a name for it. It doesn't translate to English very well. These accounts mostly take place during the first half of the 1900s and are mostly native-related, but not all. 
I talked to one white guy who, in 1968, got the bejeeber scared out of him while coming down an alder-choked gully while on a goat hunt in Portlock. Most of these accounts came before the Bigfoot hype that began to appear in the 60s and 70s in the Northwest and North California. Well, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. In January 1978, there were several sightings of hairy humanoids in the area of Ilmana in Lake and Peninsula Borough in Alaska. There were also sightings of hairy humanoids around New Whalen and Thumb in the same borough around the same time. On a late afternoon in September of 1986 in Cantwell in Denali County in Alaska, in the late afternoon, I was caribou hunting on ATVs with a friend when we saw what was moving like a moose, but it was walking on two legs. Its stride was about six feet and it crossed the stream in one step. It was approximately nine feet tall. I've been hunting all my life in Alaska and never seen one till now. The area is rolling tundra and there is a small river nearby. The creature was dark and would swing its arms as he walked. There were grizzlies around at the time we saw it. The grizzlies didn't mess with it. I know other hunters have seen it at different places where the place is full of them. During fall of 1992, the incident occurred on highway from Anchorage to Fairbanks, Alaska, just before the tourist area of the Denali Park in Matanuska, Sestina County in Alaska. A friend and I were driving back to Fairbanks from Anchorage. I was driving her truck, a 1980 Dodge D50. These trucks sit very low to the ground. It was late at night and we were just about to the tourist area of the Denali Park. It wasn't winter yet. Just before a corner, my light hit something sitting on the yellow line in the middle of the road. The lights to this truck were grossly out of adjustment, so they were pointing right at that thing. It was sitting in the middle of the road with its legs pulled up to its chest and its arms folded over its knees. Its head was between its arms, looking toward the ground. It had long, human-like hair. At first, I thought it was an orangutan. Then I thought to myself, what would an orangutan be doing in the middle of nowhere in Alaska? I've lived here almost all my life, and there is no animal like this one. I thought to myself, the only way that could have been an orangutan is if there is a circus out here. I knew that was not a possibility in such a remote area. I drove right next to it, and I was at its level. If I had been going slow, I could have touched it easily. I was freaked out and thought I must be seeing things. Maybe I was tired. My friend saw it too, although neither one of us said a word until we reached the gas station in town of Healy, just past Denali. She said, did you see that? And I said, I thought I was seeing things. This spooked us so bad, we didn't even say anything to each other about it until we were around people. We have talked about this and still agree that we saw this thing. We both have decided not to bring it up because no one believes it anyway. Why I feel this is so unusual is there is no animal native to Alaska that could resemble this thing anyway. We have bears, moose, caribou, porcupine, rabbit, etc. But none of these animals have knees or long reddish colored hair. I don't know how to explain it, and I've given up trying to because nobody believes it. They just think you're joking. I don't want to be harassed by any nut. I just want to share my genuine incident in case others have seen it. There were high cutaway em embankments on each side of the road. Ahead of us was a corner with a metal rail going downhill to the left. Once you get to the bottom of the hill, you're around the hotel and raft rental area of Denali. The landscape would be evergreen forests with birch trees, berries, lichen, and etc. 
one afternoon in February of 1994 in Haynes County in Alaska. This is a sighting that was told to me by a friend. Then I heard it from the person who was actually there. But this is how the story goes. At the time, they were young local kids, but it was winter and they were in the woods, actually really close to downtown Haynes, when they saw what they described as a huge human-like hairy animal sitting in the snow eating fish. They ran screaming to a neighbor close by who then went into the woods and saw footprints that were too far apart for him to step in with both feet. Where it was sitting, it made seat marks that could fit two people in with room to spare. Two locals that have a good reputation tell the story. One is even a minister and the young person comes from a wealthy family. When I heard the story from the horse's mouth, they began to shed tears. This obviously had a profound effect on them. The terrain is woodsy, sight inclined to the south about 200 yards from the bay. The creature was described as twice the size of any large man and covered in hair. Since I was not there, I do not have a thorough description I assure you, I've known both for quite some time. Both have no reason to lie, and if these people say it happened, then I believe them without a doubt, and I can't say that about too many people. During spring of 1995, in Prince of Wales County in Alaska, between the short yard and the garbage dump on Saltery Road in Heidelberg, I was going for a drive. I had three kids with me, my daughters and one of their cousins. It was starting to get dark. I decided I wanted to turn around and not go all the way to the sort yard. So I pulled into a turnaround. I had the car lights on. Just in the bushes on the other side of the road, I noticed some movement. I thought it might have been a deer, so I stopped the car. The first thing I really saw was really bright blue eyes. Then I noticed how far up they were. This thing had to be around eight to nine feet tall. The rest of the thing was really dark. It might have been black or dark brown. My daughter saw the feet. They were huge. When I realized it must be a Bigfoot, I freaked out and tore out of there. I've never been down there after dark again. I rarely go there at all. It didn't move after the initial movement we saw. It just stood there looking at us. There are local legends about a wild man in the woods. It was starting to get dark. We needed the lights because of the trees on both sides of the road. I think it was about five to six in the afternoon. I don't recall the weather condition. It was cold though. There was a bench on the right side of the road with a brush and a small mountain on the left and a pine forest. Recently, there has been a rash of sightings, some of them pretty close to town. The people who claim to have seen it are pretty believable people. Their stories are quite convincing. On or about the 6th of July in 1999, my husband, his father, and two friends were on the Kisiralik River above Quetzaluk, Alaska. They observed and photographed a pair of large wedge-shaped footprints deep in the mud near the water's edge. The prints are an estimated 12 to 14 inches long and were about 3 inches deep. No claws are evident at the tips of the toes. The prints appear to be consecutive and were estimated at about 6 feet apart. Our friends are experienced outdoorsmen, and neither one of them could identify the animals that made these markings. During the same time, brown bear and wolf tracks were also observed. The area is very remote, and no other boat were on the river that day. The local trappers that have looked at the footprint photo say it's the hairy man. The tracks are difficult to distinguish in the photos and they look bigger than 14 inches. On September 3, 1998, in Bethel Borough in Alaska, 
45 miles by air west of Lake Ilumna in the Mulchatna River drainage, my hunting buddy and I were sitting on a ridge watching for caribou about a thousand yards away. A large clearing was in view. While we were glassing the clearing for caribou to come out of the brush, we watched a large gray animal walking on hind legs walk between two large spruce trees on the opposite side of the clearing. We are both longtime Alaskan, avid hunters, and have logged many, many hunts in North America. I have hunted all of North America's deer, elk, black, and grizzly bears. I have never seen an animal like what we saw that day. We watched it for over half an hour move from one tree across the clearing to the other. Eventually, caribou moved into the area and we lost sight of the animal. When it moved off into heavy brush, we had never heard of a Bigfoot in Alaska. But we did tell the bush pilot that picked us up from our hunt that we'd seen something strange. He told us we had probably seen the hairy man, a well-known animal of the Ilamna region by the native people. I'm Dave, and my friend Al accompanied me on this trip. Even though it happened a few years back, it's still very fresh in my memory. I've read a number of Bigfoot accounts since this happened, and I've noticed that most people who have had encounters had no idea what was coming. A lot of people were surprised by what they saw, but that simply wasn't the case with us. We had plenty of warnings. And yet, we chose to disregard the signs and indications of trouble. Why would we do this? In retrospect, I'm not sure, except to say we were clueless. Bigfoot wasn't even on our radar, and at the time, we found all kinds of ways to discount what we were hearing and seeing, at least until it became so obvious that we finally had no choice but to wake up. When we did, it was shocking. I guess that's how we humans tend to be. We're in denial until we have to accept something. Al and I were good friends. Actually, we still are, even though this incident stretched our comfort zone with one another some. At the time, we were both working as wedding photographers in Jackson, Wyoming, which can be a pretty lucrative business in a resort town like that for lots of people want to be married with the beautiful Tetons in the background. Photography can be a tough business, primarily because everyone thinks they're a photographer, especially with the availability of good, inexpensive gear these days. Heck, you can now take photos with a cell phone that would put many professionals to shame. Because of this, it's hard to make a living anymore doing stock photography, so lots of photographers have switched to shooting weddings, even though they prefer to be landscape or wildlife photographers. That's exactly how it was with us. Al and I go way back, clear to high school, in the little town of Pinedale, Wyoming. We became friends in our high school photography club, and even though we both went our separate ways after graduation, we met up again in Jackson at a workshop given by a famous wildlife photographer there. At that point, we were both married and working jobs we hated. We decided to pool our money and do some marketing, and for some reason, our business really took off. We became the go-to people in that area for wedding photography. Wedding photography is typically hectic and stressful. You don't get a second chance on shot, and they'd better be good. Four, you're recording a once-in-a-lifetime event. We worked well as a team, and Al would take videos while I did the still. So, we were used to working under pressure. Well, autumn this happened. We'd been working hard all summer, making good money, but we were exhausted, and we decided we needed a break. Our hearts have always been in landscape and wildlife photography. So, we talked about it and decided to go on up to Glacier National Park for two weeks. Since it was late September, we knew the park visitation would be slowing with most tourists gone. 
we could do some nice day hikes and hopefully get some good photographs of the autumn colors, as well as maybe film a few bears before they went into hibernation. The plan was to rent something near Glacier, which would mean we could have the comforts of home and yet get going really early and take the hikers to where we want it to be each day. If you want good landscape shots, you need to get out before sunrise, so you can be where you want when the sun actually comes up. Early mornings were also the best time for wildlife shots. So, we rented a place for a week near West Glacier, the west entrance of the park. We then rented a small cabin at Many Glaciers for the second week, over on the other side of the park. Neither were fancy or anything, since all we really wanted was a place to sleep. We hoped to be out and about every day making photos. We were excited, as we'd been talking about maybe putting together some coffee table book or a calendar, and we knew from friends that anything to do with Glacier usually sold well. Our conversation on the way up there from Jackson was mostly about how we were going to use this as a springboard to get us out of the wedding business. We were both Wyoming boys, and to be honest, it was our nature to be solitary. That's why we'd chosen photography in the first place. Well, going to Glacier was just what the doctor ordered. And I will say our first week was fantastic. We spent time on the shores of Lake McDonald, which is one of the most photographed places in Glacier, and for good reason. We ventured up to Bowman and Kintla Lake in the North Fork region, with good results there also. But a few days after we arrived, something strange happened. We'd hiked up to Avalanche Lake, a popular spot not far from the avalanche campground. We had set up our cameras by the lower part of the lake when a group of hikers came by. They stopped, all excited, telling us we should pack up and get out. When we finally got them slowed down enough to make sense, they told us they'd been up at the top of the lake just below the headwall of the valley when they'd heard a strange howling coming from high above. They said they at first thought it was wolves, but when they looked up, they could see two dark animals way up on the steep wall, a place wolves could never go. Plus, these things were too big for wolves. The howling deteriorated into shrieks, and the things started throwing rocks down the cliff. Since these things obviously had hands, the kids weren't sure what to think, so they took off, terrified. Well, Al and I, both in our late 40s, were old geezers compared to these kids, who looked to be in their late teens if that, and our first thought was that they were playing a trick on us. I mean, the whole story was preposterous, even though they were pretty convincing, but their supposed fear was contagious, enough that we both packed up our gear and followed them back down to the campground. Once back, the kids asked us to take a group photo of them using their cell phones, which we did, and Al also took one with his camera. After everything was over and done, we later studied that photo, trying to figure out from the looks on their faces if they seemed honest or not, and we had to say that they did. They really seemed genuinely scared. I guess I have to say that this was the beginning of our refusal to acknowledge that there was something strange in Glacier, something we would later meet in an up-close and personal way. By saying these kids were fooling us, we denied the possibility that what they saw was real, a denial that might have saved us from what we later experienced, though who knows? Would we have gone home if we believed them? Probably not, but we might have been more careful about where we went and what we did, being aware that there were strange creatures out and about. Well, our first week was up, and as we looked through our photos, I will say we were both very pleased with the results. A lot of stunning sunrises and sunsets, as well as photos of aspen and larches in their fall colors, great shots of moose, elk, deer, various birds, and even a few black bears, 
though no grizzlies, but we were pretty sure we'd seen a few over on the other side of the peak. For the transition from west to east of the park, we planned a special side trip. We'd hike the High Line Trail to the Granite Park Chalet and spend the night, then hike back out over Swift Current Path, which would take us to the parking lot at our cabin at the Swift Current Motor Lodge in Many Glacier. We would leave our car at the cabin there at the start of the hike, then ride the shuttle to the top of Logan Path, which divided the east and west side, and was also where the High Line started. By hiking to the Granite Park Chalet, we would see some of the interior of the park and yet not have to carry backpacking gear as the chalet provided sleeping accommodation, as well as food if you pre-ordered it, though you had to cook it yourself at the chalet kitchen. Granite Park Chalet is a small, swift-looking rock building built in 1914 by the Great Northern Railway as part of their agenda to make Glacier more amiable to tourists. The chalet is accessible only by hiking, and it's like a backcountry hostel. The rooms have bunks, and they provide bedding if you pay extra. It was the perfect setup for us, for with all of our photography equipment, carrying overnight gear would be a bit much for two middle-aged guys who were more than a bit out of shape. When we got off the shuttle at the top of Logan Pass and headed for the High Line, we were at first pretty disappointed, for we weren't expecting to encounter so many people there. The rest of the park was pretty empty because it was so late in the season, but I think every person who visits Glacier has to go see the High Line. But it didn't take long for the trail to clear out, for after about a third of a mile, you reach a narrow section that turns most people around. I mean, it's maybe four feet wide along a wall with a drop-off several hundred feet. If you have a fear of height, you're not going one step further, even though the park has installed cables along the wall to hold on to. This section only lasts three-tenths of a mile, but that's an eternity if you're terrified. It did make for some good photos, as well as help clear the crowd. After that stretch, you hike several miles, then cross Haystack Path, which is a few hundred feet up, a couple of switchbacks, then everything else is pretty much downhill to the chalet. It's a little over six miles, and you're in the heart of Glacier with fantastic views all around, looking across a huge valley to the Livingston Range, which is very picturesque. Well, we stopped for a while after crossing Haystack Pass and let time get away from us, and having to film a stunning sunset didn't help things. But we weren't too worried, as we knew the chalet wasn't far, maybe a couple of miles. We could easily hike that before dark. We also had our headlamp, so we pretty much just moseyed along. As it got along toward dusk, I guess it finally dawned on us where we were, and that it might be prudent to get a move on. Glacier is famous for its bears, and one doesn't really want to be lollygagging along a trail there in the dark. And just as we upped our pace, we could hear someone coming. It was getting hard to make out much, but we finally saw a man hiking up the trail. As he got closer, I could see he looked tired, and I wondered why he was hiking out so late. There was no way he'd make the trailhead at Logan Pass before it was pitch dark. Most of the trail was fairly easy, but the switchbacks over Haystack Pass might be tricky, as well as the wall by the cable. He looked startled when he saw us, then stopped, saying out of the blue, something's following me. I thought his face looked very white, though it was hard to tell in the twilight. Are you camping? I asked. Where's your gear? He answered. I was going to the chalet, but decided to turn around when I heard something growling. Growling? Al asked. Like a bear? Or wolf? It's really rare for wolves to attack a person, but being out here alone in the dark might not be such a good idea. The man replied, I don't normally hike after dark, but I got off work late. I know to make noise to tell bears I'm coming, but if you're going to the chalet, you might want to turn around 
and hike out with me. I work at the Lake McDonald Lodge, and I've hiked this park for years. I know what wolves sound like, and I can tell you what I heard wasn't wolf or a bear. Now, Al said, well, maybe you should hike to the chalet with us. Whatever was following you, you'll be okay. As there's safety in numbers, bears don't like groups. Better than hiking out alone to Logan. Al was obviously concerned, trying to talk the guy out of going on by himself. As we stood there, things getting darker by the moment. I could feel the night chill coming on. It wasn't a bear, the guy said, shrugging his shoulders. He sat on a nearby rock, catching his breath. I'm Jesse, he sighed. I guess I really should stay with you guys, but the idea of going back seems like the wrong decision. My energy's a bit depleted, and I tend to get a little hypoglycemic. I dug an apple from my pack and handed it to him, introducing myself and Al. He thanked me, then began munching on it. I was about ready to climb a tree, he now said matter-of-factly. A tree? Why would you climb a tree? I asked. It felt safer. As Al and I stood there, waiting for Jesse to eat his apple and get his blood sugar level back to normal, the most horrible sound I've ever heard before or since came from far below us in the valley. It's hard to describe, but others have said it sounds like a woman screaming, being killed in a most horrible way. Jesse jumped up, and the three of us stood there in the near dark, as Al said. That was a mountain lion. I've heard them before down in Wyoming. It's a very intimidating sound. The one I heard had just brought down a deer, which I knew because I came across it on my hike out. If you get on the internet, you might be able to find a recording of one. Are you sure that's what it was? Jesse asked doubtfully. No question about it. I'd stake my life that that's what was following you. It found a deer for dinner instead. Let's go on to the chalet. We won't have any trouble now. I don't know why, but I was now feeling a sense of dread. Was I feeding off Jesse's fear? It didn't seem like it, as he seemed pretty calm at that point. I hesitated, then said, Al, I think we should listen to Jesse and hike back out. Something's wrong. I can't explain it, but my gut says to turn back. It's the lion, Al repeated impatiently. Your gut telling you a large, dangerous predator is near. And it is, but it won't be interested in us anymore. We're not that far from the chalet. Now, let me say that, having grown up in Pinedale, Wyoming, in the shadow of the mighty Wind River Range, home to Grizzlies, and then living in Jackson near Yellowstone, I've seen and been around my share of large predators, mostly bears. I know to be cautious, but I wasn't typically afraid like I was that evening out on the trail. I added, Al, you know me. I'm not normally afraid, but my intuition says we should go back. The conversation went back and forth for a while, Al finally convincing me that I was just feeling the effect of the lion's murderous sounding yowl. I recalled what the kids up at Avalanche Lake had claimed to have heard and seen but decided not to bring it up, as I didn't want to scare Jesse even more. Finally, Al convinced us to head on to the chalet, partly because we knew it was way closer than Logan Pass, and the thought of hiking down the switchback at Haystack Pass in the dark was intimidating. We picked up our pack and all headed down the trail, though I noticed Jesse strategically placed himself between Al and me. We continued on toward the chalet, the shadows lengthening, hiking in silence. Somehow, it seemed that the further we went, the stranger things felt. It had kind of started with Jesse's comment about climbing a tree, an action that seemed logical but actually wasn't, as most predators can also climb, something someone would think of doing when they weren't thinking rationally. It got worse and worse until it became a bizarre, out-of-focus feeling. It reminded me later of when you get out of a long bout of dental work. You're disoriented and unsure of yourself, and it takes a while to get back to reality. Except, our reality kept getting more unreal. I don't think it had anything to do with Jesse personally, but I do think, in retrospect, he brought it with him, though not intentionally. 
I think that whatever had been following him was now following us, in spite of Al being so certain it was a big cat that was now sidetracked feeding on a deer. Al was wrong, as we found out, and wrong in a bad way, a really bad way that he would soon take the brunt of. We've never hiked the High Line before, but Jesse had, and he said we were close to the chalet, but it never appeared. We just kept hiking on and on until it was dark enough that we needed our headlamps to continue. As we stopped to dig them out of our packs, Jesse remarked, We should have been at the chalet by now. Something's wrong. Is it easy to miss? Al asked. No. It's very visible from the trail. Even at night, you can see the inside light. But I think we somehow passed it. We decided to continue on for a while, then recoined her, hoping we just misjudged the distance, but we soon came to a fork in the trail, a branch leading off to our right, even though it was fairly dark. We could see the outline of a ridge where it looked like the trail began climbing. This is the fork to Swift Current Path, Jesse said. We missed the chalet, but it's not far behind us. How we overlooked the cutoff from the main trail is beyond me, but at least now I know where we are. We turned around, relieved, now following Jesse, but it was only a moment later that we almost ran into him, for he had stopped smack in the middle of the trail. There's something ahead, he said under his breath. I could tell he was scared, but at least he didn't try to get in between Al and me. We stood there, listening, when suddenly, far in the distance, came a mournful howling sound. Al whispered, wolves. Jesse simply said, not wolves. Then what is it, I asked. I don't know, Jesse replied, barely audible. I've heard lots of wolves, and it's not wolves. I again flashed back on the kids at Avalanche Lake. They'd heard strange howls, then seen the two black figures climbing the wall. I felt a chill go up my spine. Let me lead, I said to Jesse. We have to get to the chalet. Whatever it is, there's three of us, and hopefully only one of them. I nodded to Al as I got out my bear spray, and I noted he did the same. Seeing us, Jesse pointed to his belt, where his spray was already handy, which made sense, since he'd been on high alert before even meeting up with us. How far back is the chalet? I asked Jesse. Not far. Watch for a trail that takes off to the right, he replied. I took my headlamp off my forehead, holding it in my hand, so I could more easily scan the trail ahead. I saw nothing unusual, watching carefully for the side trail. We didn't want to miss it again, as it was now almost pitch black. Fortunately, it wasn't long before it came into view, but as I turned, I caught a glimpse of something off to my left. Then saw a large rock coming my way, barely missing me. It was hard to tell, but it looked to be the size of a grapefruit. I yelled something, though I can't remember what, and it's probably not repeatable anyway. Then I ducked, as that was followed by another smaller rock that hit my shoulder, making it sting. Now Al was also yelling, and the rocks suddenly started coming in like hail. Whatever was throwing them was strong, as the rocks were big. Al began picking up the incoming rocks and throwing the ones he could back at the shadows. But when Jesse yelled for us to run, we did, following his headlamp up the trail, rocks lobbing in behind us. I had no idea how far the chalet was, but it had to be close or we were goners. For there was no way to even use our bear spray. Whatever or whoever was throwing the rocks was staying hidden in the trees. I again thought of the kids at Avalanche Lake. Hadn't they said the black creatures were throwing rocks? Everything seemed to slow down, as if it were just a dream. I felt several more large rocks hit my pack, and later I found one of my lenses had been totally shattered. Al also later found some of his equipment damaged, and we both shudder to think of what our backs would have looked like if we hadn't been carrying packs. I could now see dim light ahead, and I knew it was the chalet. Jesse must have been in much better shape than we were, for he'd completely disappeared. I knew Al was close behind as I heard him say, Dave, don't leave me. When I heard him make a loud moan, 
I knew something was wrong. I stopped and turned, shining my headlamp back, and I could see he was on the ground. Even though I wanted to keep running, I stopped and went to his side. I knew he'd been hit by a rock. He was trying to get back up, blood streaming down his face, and I reached out to help him when I saw a big hand grab him by the leg. Either the thing's body was out of range of my light, or I've repressed what it looked like, but I'll never forget that hand. I know it was attached to an arm, but it seemed like an entity all on its own. It was this big hand with a dark leathery palm and black hair on its back. Its nails were long and thick and a yellow-brown color, as if it had been digging in the dirt. And it was huge, probably three times the size of my hand, and I'm pretty much an average-sized guy at six feet tall, not at all small. As it turned out later, after cleaning up Al's head wound, we found that it was just a surface wound with lots of blood, but his real injury was from that hand. It had tore up his pants and left several deep marks in his leg that he later had stitched up, but even at that, he now has long scars. He used to wear shorts a lot, but he never does now, as the scars make him look like he was attacked by a vampire. I was pulling on Al in one direction, and the hand was pulling on his leg, while poor Al was moaning and trying to get up. I felt I was losing the battle, and as I glanced up to see several other dark shadows coming in, I knew I had to do something and fast. I was no match for even one of these things, yet alone several, and, of course, Jesse was long gone. I held up my bear spray to take off the safety, and the minute I did, the hand let go. I knew the creature had to know what bear spray was to react like that. People have said it was a bear, but bears don't have hands like that. I quickly grabbed Al and pulled him, his pack falling from his back as I did so. Now, you can tell Al's a true photographer by what he did next, and I find it hard to believe, but he grabbed his pack, pulled his camera from it, and began shooting photos. A lot of the more expensive cameras don't have built-in flashes, but Al grabbed his little snapshot camera, which did. He managed to shoot off a dozen or more photos as I stood there dumbfounded and unable to move. I'll save you the suspense by saying these creatures vanished so quickly that only a couple of his photos captured anything of interest, and that was just some large, shadowy figures with no detail. I know he would have found fame and fortune if they'd turned out. Suddenly, whereas I'd felt as if I was walking around in a cloud, my head was clear as a bell, and I got Al turned around and headed toward the chalet. Jesse helped us through the door. Then, we somehow found a chair and examined Al's wound. A guy who'd been standing on the upper deck of the stone building was aware something strange had just come down, and he asked if we were okay. Come to find out, he was one of the chalet's caretakers, and after we got Al fixed up as best as we could, the sky checked us in, and even though we were late enough that the kitchen was closed, he went in and cooked our pre-ordered dinner for us. His name was Kevin, and he was a super guy. Al didn't feel much like eating, so Kevin brought him some broth. Then we pretty much put Al to bed with some painkillers that Kevin kept for emergencies. Al had acted like nothing much was going on through the whole thing, and we thought the wound on his head was the extent of it. And it wasn't until the next day we found the deep scratches in his legs, his pants soaked with blood. I felt really bad about not noticing that sooner, but kind of wrote it off to the weird mind space we'd all been in that night. Fortunately, the pack horses had come in that morning from Packer's Roost, bringing in supplies for the chalet, and Al managed to hitch a ride down that way while I walked out with them. The Packer guys then gave us a ride to the park headquarters in West Glacier, where a ranger took us to an urgent care clinic, where they cleaned Al's wound and stitched them up, then gave him a tetanus shot. I later got a ride in the park shuttle over to Many Glacier to retrieve our car, thinking our second week's reservations there would be a wash. But after I went and got Al from the clinic, we decided to go on back to the cabin we'd rented and just hang out while he recovered. He would need to return to the clinic several times to have the bandages changed and the wounds cleaned, and though he initially had some pain from the gouges, they healed pretty fast, and his head wound was actually pretty minor. 
so no problems there. We spent a pretty quiet week at Many Glacier, and I actually ended up enjoying it. Al wasn't able to walk far, but we got some nice photos from the shores of nearby Swift Current Lake, and also took some nice drives to places like St. Mary's Lake and to Medicine. We stuck near the car, but that was okay, as I had no intention of going into the backcountry again, at least not in Glacier. But what was really interesting was the talk I had with Kevin up at the chalet after Al had gone to bed and Jesse was in his room. Kevin said he'd worked at the chalet for several years, but this would be his last season. When I told him what had happened, he called the creatures Bigfoot and said they were getting bolder and bolder as time went on. We were the first he'd known who'd actually been attacked, but he'd heard plenty of stories where hikers had been intimidated and docked. Kevin's theory was that these animals were fed up with people, just like me and Al had been with the wedding business, and they were getting more aggressive. He worried about someone actually being killed and wondered if some of those who'd gone missing in the park weren't the victims of angry creatures who felt like their territory was being invaded. This was just his theory, but it makes sense to me, and I can say I pretty much identify with them. It seems like we humans are invading every place more and more, and what's worse is how we act like we're entitled to do so. It's actually pretty sad to me, even though these things almost killed Al, but maybe I'd feel the same way if I were in their shoes. Both Al and I left the wedding business and went on to other things, tired of the stress and difficult people. He and his wife moved to Casper, Wyoming, where he worked at a car dealership, and I stayed in Jackson, doing the night stocking at a grocery store. I'll retire soon, and when I do, my wife and I are moving back to Pinedale, where I hope to spend most of my time fishing, but not in any places where Bigfoot could potentially hang out, though I know they can pretty much go wherever they please. And hopefully, if I am in their territory, They'll just make some noise instead of throwing rocks. That's all I'll need to know to move on. And just a little growl or two. On to the next one. Do Sasquatch hibernate? This is a subject that remains to be proven. However, we believe we have solved this question at least for our region. My interest in this project began when I attended a seminar conducted by the well-accredited Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, who is a respected authority on the Sasquatch Bigfoot creatures. Myself and a few other retired teachers of varying subjects all met over and during several different occasions while attending the most entertaining subject of the Bigfoot creatures and we eventually formed a study group, more for our own entertainment than for any official sanctioned research. Our major concern came about after we found enough believable evidence that the Sasquatch does exist, but not credible evidence had been offered as to whether or not the creature hibernates. Therefore, I took it on myself to volunteer to do what no one else in our group was crazy enough to dare. I soon found out why. One of our team has a close friend whom we will refer to as Sam, who left the world of academia to retire on a very remote property in Colorado that was pretty much central to much of the information that our group had gathered regarding the majority of the most credible claims of Sasquatch encounters and sightings. Our contact was kind enough to secure an invitation for me to travel up into this remote location and use this man, Sam's, private road through his acreage to gain access to an otherwise impossible route to a mountain canyon that was often referred to as the Sasquatch Ridge. In fact, our group is in possession of three old and out-of-print maps that all refer to the same Sasquatch Ridge Trail. Since my partner had such a close relationship with the man who we call Sam, we obtained permission to gain access to the almost inaccessible old road that we had seen referenced on the old government maps 
at Thathbot Ridge, and the thin dotted line leading to the ridge as Sasquatch Ridge Trail. Sam told us that the references to these animals were immediately removed before the next printing due to the fact that two two-man teams had totally disappeared over a six-month period and both of their abandoned vehicles were found at the same trailhead that their teams had used for their mountain ascent. No trace of the men was ever found. Thus, the authorities removed all reference to the Sasquatch. There were only a few of the old cartographers around anymore that had any recollection of those bygone days, according to Sam, and he allowed us to use his copy to make notations on our current production map. As my partner Roy noted, in ink, the thin line that leads up as Sasquatch Trail and the horizontal bar indicating the ridge line as Sasquatch Ridge. There, he made a star to mark our destination. The only evidence of those lost teams was a silver-plated whiskey flask that had the initials of a doctor of anthropology who was with one of the two teams, but not another shred of evidence was ever discovered, only their vehicle. It had taken quite a bit of wrangling and finagling for our team members to get permission for us to use this man's property for my search, but he absolutely insisted that there be at least two of us to make the trek, and he also made us agree to leave another two men to make a base camp at the place the ancient road stops and the trail begins to ascend the canyon leading to the mesa far above. We readily agreed, and then we had to go through selecting those four men who would go, as it now seemed that the entire group wanted to go. Out of respect for the use of Sam's property, we narrowed the selection to a final three plus myself, whom he concurred with. We prepared as best we could, and from previous explorations that many of us had learned from, we made pretty short work of gathering our supplies and since the first traces of the colors of fall, we were already hitting the upper mountain, where we all sat at base camp. Roy and myself, who would make the trek upward, found ourselves shouldering our more than heavy backpack and waving goodbye to our comrades below as we began the gut-wrenching ascent up the trail. Jerry and Bill were chopping firewood from an old log as we left, so they would be comfortable. Thanks to Sam's generous permission to use this upper route, we were already a day or two closer to our goal of reaching what we perceived from our research and visual sightings through our binoculars to be a huge plateau atop where we were now headed. It wasn't long before we had to make our first stop to rest our legs from the intense pain of the climb, and already the altitude was taking its toll on us both. Before too much further, the inch of the previous day's snow was making our climb even more difficult, as the light snowfall had covered the trail just enough to camouflage the loose rocks underneath. This slowed our progress significantly. We continued to climb toward a rather dark, wide area beneath a snow-covered overhang, and it gave the appearance of a jutting cliff under which we might rest a bit from the light snow that had now begun to fall. The kind of flakes that seem to have a penchant for sticking to eyebrows and eyelashes, so one finds himself continually wiping them away as when fighting mosquitoes in a swarm. Not nearly as painful, however. Roy thought to take a compass bearing to check our path ahead with our map. However, there was some sort of magnetic attraction that eliminated any chance of accuracy. Besides that, I jokingly reminded him that the only direction that we cared about was up. As we rounded the gradual turn to our right, the trail almost seemed to be guiding us to a specific goal, as the climb was becoming easier and we were no longer having to step over rocks and boulders. A few hundred yards further, we found ourselves approaching a thick pine forest on a kind of mesa almost as if the entire top of this tall peak had suddenly been sheared off 
and a thick forest had mysteriously spread it up. Even the trail we were now walking on was dirt rather than hard rock, and the dirt was thickly covered in pine needles. We now seemed to be on a well-pronounced and well-traveled trail, as we wound slowly around the peak of this low mountain toward the strange-shaped cone on top that we only had an occasional glimpse of until now. As the trail continued through the forest, I was still continually looking for what type of animals were using it, and the unnerving sight of a large and unmistakable paw print of a bear stopped me in my tracks, and Roy came up from behind me to see what I was kneeling over. We determined that it was the track of a black bear and not a grizzly, which, if it had been a grizz, I would have probably wanted to give up going further. The track was only a clear print as it was a sheltered dirt area where the snow had failed to cover it. After Roy examined the track more closely, he determined from his extensive hunting experience that it was likely several days old, and he surmised that with the sudden change in the weather two days before, that the animal was likely in a den somewhere close by, and we could forget about him until late spring. I breathed another sigh of relief as the track fled downhill toward a thick grove of pines and a jumble of a landslide that had long ago devastated an entire grove of pines. It looked like a huge pile of places for bears to hibernate within. The apparently heavily used trail slowly continued in a wide arc around the high peak staring down at us until we once again entered another thick growth of pines and firs. The trail had now become hard to navigate and Roy wondered aloud at how difficult it must be for deer or bear to travel such a circuitous route. And then we stopped and looked at each other, Sasquatch. As we now, even more slowly, continued on the trail, we stopped often to survey the forest around us as the trail narrowed, and we could now once again feel the cold wind that indicated we had come full circle around the peak of this lower mountain, and before we could decide what to do next, a sudden movement down the trail leading into the thicker first below us made our choice clear. There, not forty yards from where we stood, was clearly a young Sasquatch. We had both been focused on where the trail we were on went, down the hill and into the thick green wall of trees, at a point beside a monstrously tall fir tree, and at that very moment, a Sasquatch that we figured to be about six feet tall, by the way, its height showed it to be next to a branch of the tree, it immediately retreated behind upon, spotting us as we blustered and pointed like amateurs at it. After all, there are few professional watchers, if any. We cautiously and carefully made our way down the short but steep slope and stepped into the narrow opening between the monstrous fir and another one about half as big next to it, where we found ourselves among the true giants of this well-concealed forest that almost totally blocked out the sun. It was colder now, and we had used up almost all of our daylight in our excitement. And it was even more apparent in the dark but beautiful forest. We forgot all about the Sasquatch, with night about to descend, and we fortunately found a large monolith of a fir that must have fallen from old age or fierce wind as it lay with its trunk extended toward the steep slope. We took shelter in the huge hole beneath the root ball that had long since lost its spidery roots. We gathered up the aging pieces of branches and limbs that had dried over the years to make us a campfire that old Daniel Boone would have been proud of, being exhausted from the most difficult hike I had ever made, and Roy looking like a zombie, we hovered over a toasty fire pit and stayed busy congratulating ourselves on our discovery. Even though there was only a light dusting of snow so far, we knew that not all the Sasquatch were bedded down for the winter. Reminding ourselves that our group had previously discussed at length that our goal was to determine whether or not the Sasquatch hibernate were undoubtedly against all odds, as we had already seen that the animals were out and about. 
With the snow that had begun falling, we knew that we didn't have the time to wait much longer to find out whether or not they did or did not. We had discussed this matter at great length, knowing that the best of odds in learning the truth would be to await signs of their movement in the spring. The difficulty in that thinking, however, was that it was not even conceivable that one could be anywhere near a hibernating creature at the exact moment it comes out of hibernation in the spring, the where and when could take a lifetime of study and still fail. Gathering sticks, bark chunks, and branches, we built up a strong fire in a way that when we awoke the next morning, we still had a good bed of coals. The night had been quiet and uneventful, and as we made a breakfast, we could finally see around us the extra large hole the giant tree's root had left when it toppled over. There was something different about this hole, however. On the sides of this large excavation, there seemed to be something wrong. Something just didn't fit. It was just a feeling like there was something different about the way the tree had uprooted the root on the upper stump appeared to have been cut, as the spidery roots so commonly found on the uprooted trees were notably absent. As we exited our shelter, we began walking among these monstrous behemoths, and it appeared that at one time there had to have been a tremendous windstorm that hit this mountain in order for it to topple so many trees. Something, however, was not making sense. I signaled Roy to join me as I walked further down the slope, stopping to more closely examine the fallen trees. They all seemed to have fallen in the same direction, but not at all at the same time, and this slope was quite well protected from winds by the ridge nearby, so something wasn't adding up. Then we had an idea at the same time, and as we dropped into another hole, we found that it had a soft bottom. Beneath the dirt in the floor of the holes we now checked, we found that each contained an entire deep layer of pine boughs. Pulling up on one pile, it revealed itself to be several feet thick. We ran back to our shelter of the night before, and its floor was not at all like the other two. Suddenly, the reason became readily apparent. This tree still had a full complement of branches, and they were still green, as it had obviously recently fallen. A quick check of all the other downed trees showed they all had thick carpets of branches and pine needles packed deep on the floors. We spent half the day searching this hillside, and then we went into another thick forest of several species of balsam and other evergreens that neither of us knew what they were. But in the thick forest of balsam, we found definite evidence that something had purposefully dug up the entire one side of several individual trees, and it appeared that someone or something had been working diligently at severing and smashing the roots on only one side of the tree. Then we knew that the Sasquatch had the superior intelligence to expend the effort to steadily weaken a tree to cause it to fall over, or, in the large cases, to weaken the root structure so the next strong wind would cause it to topple. Then, in the late fall, the animals would gather boughs and leaves to pile into the holes where the roots had been and await the coming of the first heavy snow while they rested under their warm blanket. We decided to spend more time in this area rather than go any further up the mountain, as had been our original plan after carefully analyzing the route we had intended to travel. Reason being was we only had one goal when we began our climb, and it didn't make any sense to climb higher in search of some mystical cave or canyon where Sasquatch assembled to wait out winter. That made no sense whatsoever to even think for a minute that an animal with the intelligence of these creatures had already been proven to have would gather in a group and risk perishing together in some bitter cold cave. We began searching further, and in the dim light that managed to penetrate the thick blanket of pines, we slowly made our way downward, and we continued to find signs where certain trees had been dug out around their upper sides of their trunks, and there was evidence that the exposed root had been smashed and cut through, and then they seemed to have been covered with dead branches and pine needles 
to mask the progress of weakening the uphill support so as to allow the constant mountain winds and to eventually finish the job and fell the tree in the direction the clever animals had predetermined. This process of creating future shelters seemed at first to be a painstakingly slow process, but as we discussed throughout our search, the obvious slow birth rate suspected among the species would not make it necessary to rush the process, and we found evidence in several instances that were obviously more recent diggings due to the fact that there were massive amounts of needles still clinging to the branches, and that drew us to more closely inspect the massive root balls. We found that in many cases where needles remained thick on branches of felled trees, that the enormous root systems showed signs of fresh cut, which we have deduced to be evidence confirming our theory that although no longer standing, somehow these root systems may have been covered by the Sasquatch to keep them alive and still nourishing the host tree, even as it lay dormant and dying. At first, this made no sense, but then we found more evidence that something seemed to have chewed on many of these attached roots. Our first reaction had been that squirrels were actively eating these roots, but the few squirrels we had seen at this altitude had easier pickings in the safety of the tree branches and it is common knowledge that squirrels prefer deciduous trees, so it was not even conceivable that the squirrels would risk themselves to seek out the root of dying pine trees. Having eliminated that thought, we began to more closely examine several more of these root balls, and after hours more climbing in and out of several more holes and shifting through the floors of these holes, we have reached what we believe to be absolute proof that the Sasquatch does indeed hibernate. We further state our belief that this elusive species hibernates together as a family unit. Judging from our many excavations, there is adequate evidence that these creatures, in most cases, wait until the first heavy snowfall covers the entire forest in a deep blanket of permanent covering. The young ones, due to the evidence of smaller teeth marks, will often nibble on the living root in their chamber prior to completely sleeping for the winter. This may be a way of slowly easing into hibernation until the heavier snows steal their hideaway. Further evidence helped prove our theory when the huge trees had fallen, wherein the terrain had caused the root ball to have broken all of the roots completely. These holes had no evidence of any occupancy whatsoever. We concluded that the nesting chambers the Bigfoot are carefully chosen by them in advance, and part of their consideration may be that they prefer live root systems. We also found what seemed like piles of boughs that in each case had been torn off live trees of other species that showed evidence that the bark had been chewed off as these branches seemed to have been collected as humans would to bring nighttime snacks into bedroom. A strange analogy but the Sasquatch seemed to have many habits similar to humans. We reasoned also that these food sources would perhaps have been to assist the animal transition into hibernation. My partner's remark of Sasquatch snack still makes a lot of sense, at least it seemed to in the sub-zero temperatures. We made camp a ways back in a patch of balsams that were out of sight of this obvious Sasquatch territory and had a rather fitful sleep, which we both attributed to being in the home of these giant creatures, brought on sleep-inducing stress as we half expected to be attacked at any moment. We awoke to a blanket of white, an unexpected early snowfall that, from the accumulation already covering our boot soles, we took the hint and packed up to return to our base camp. This was definitely the beginning of winter. Roy agreed to my assessment as he had grown up in this country, and he said the last winter report he had heard told of a probability for an early snowfall, which this late in the season, it would likely stay, so it made sense for us not to stay. The snow was falling heavier now, and both of us were entirely focused on placing our every step, when suddenly Roy's arm shot out to block my next step, and as I raised my eyes to the trail ahead, a dark shape ducked immediately 
into the darkness of the forest. All Roy whispered was Bigfoot, and we continued where the tracks of the animal were now blending into the white blanket of snow. We knew that trying to pursue the creature would be fruitless, so we continued downward while an occasional backward glance briefly caught a glimpse of the dark shadow of the Sasquatch again stepping out to resume its trek up the trail. Having been alerted, we now paid more heed to the trail further down, and on several more occasions, we caught quick glimpses of dark shapes against the now much whiter background. Eventually, we made it out once more into the open where we could again see blue sky. We gave each other a high five because we had just confirmed what we had long suspicioned, that the Sasquatch prepared their winter quarters and then remain somewhat active at lower elevations until they sensed the coming of the first major snowfall of the season. And once it began, they moved into their pre-selected winter quarters at the higher elevations, where they were assured that the winter would set in solidly for the season. They seemed to wait until the very last minute to assure that there was no chance of being discovered in their winter chambers. We finally made it to the low enough altitude where the snow had not yet fallen, and there were Jerry and Bill, and, as if they had known we were coming, they were all packed and ready to go. We wasted no time in heading out, and as we started at a quick pace downward, a light sprinkle of snow began to fall, as if to discourage us from changing our minds. After all, we were the only things on this mountain that didn't belong. On to the next one. Sometime in the afternoon on December 5th, 1998, Derek Enbretson, his father Robert, and his grandfather Bob, 64, set out for a densely wooded mountainside above Upper Klamath Lake, about 30 miles north of Klamath Falls. They planned to find a Christmas tree for the holiday season, Derek was never seen again. Because of his love of the outdoors, Derek was known as Bear Boy at the age of eight. A week after he was born, his mother had carried him on a bear hunt in a pack. In his youth, he hunted with his father and picked mushrooms with his mother's father. On several of his mushroom expedition, he had visited Pelican Butte, east of the Cascade Range in South Central Oregon, lies Upper Klamath Lake, a large, shallow freshwater lake. Pelican Butte rises over 3,800 feet above the shore of Crater Lake and is a steep-sided dormant shield volcano located 20 miles, 45 kilometers south of the crater. The Engbretson family did not plan to go Christmas tree hunting that year in the woods. Although Robert looked forward to a family Christmas tree hunt every year, it was his wife, Lori, who convinced him to use an artificial tree that year. Lori wanted to keep the mess to a minimum, but when a disabled neighbor asked for a tree, Robert went into the woods. Bob remembers telling his father that since it was already after 2 p.m., it would be dark at around 4, since it was late in the year and he was driving along West Side Road in his red Toyota pickup. On his way to Rocky Point Resort, Bob pulled into a turnout at milepost 12. The three of them climbed up an embankment into a pine forest after Robert helped Derek get into his blue snowsuit. Derek walked behind Robert, who told him to stay with his grandfather. Derek nagged his grandfather that he wanted to catch up with his father as he chopped at small trees with his hatchet. At some point, the grandfather relented and the boy headed off in search of his father. With the darkness closing in, Robert and Bob met up. Where's Derek? Robert recalls asking. Bob replied, I thought he was with you. He was with you. Despite the steady falling of heavy, wet snow, Robert turned back up the hill. He called out to Derek, but no response came. Robert flagged down Fred Hines, a motorist, driving along the road at 4.13 p.m., and he requested he dial 911 so that the authorities could be notified. In the resort two miles away from the area where Derek vanished, Hines made the call. 
Over the course of two weeks, hundreds of people searched through several feet of snow using snowmobiles and dogs to search for Derek. Lori slept in a donated camper van at the turnout, hoping Derek would see the bonfire and come to her. She thought she saw Derek waving and smiling at her when she was delirious from a lack of sleep. This was not the case. Derek's tracks were found by Robert and other members of the family in the newly fallen snow in the hours immediately following his disappearance. Derek had lain down in a clearing near the road to make a snow angel and his boot prints were spotted near the spot where Robert had last seen him. There had been a snow plow that came by and the tracks leading away from the angel were obliterated. There were no tracks leading toward the woods from the angel. A small area of the trees near the road was damaged by Derek's hatchet cut. The father was confident that his son did not re-enter the wood. Early in the evening, five to eight inches of snow had fallen on Rocky Point. A candy wrapper was found and a makeshift lean-to shelter was found made from branches. But it was unclear whether these items belonged to Derek. Derek's family believed that he had made his way to the road and was probably picked up by a stranger. This explanation was dismissed by the sheriff. Bob discovered a hole in the lake and a child's footprint on the bank during the search. The next day, divers searched the area again, and additional searches were carried out during the spring thaw. However, nothing was found. Lori and Robert were informed by Klamath County authorities that their son was likely dead, eight days after Derek disappeared. During the next seven days, Robert, Lori, and about a hundred volunteers stayed on the mountain. Speculation intensified that Derek had been kidnapped when sub-zero temperatures forced the Engbertsons to end their search on December 8, 1998. Robert drove straight from his graveyard shift at work to the mountain to meet Lori every weekend for the next two years. The searched areas were marked on a map. It was widely believed that authorities were too slow to arrive at the scene the night Derek disappeared, which led to criticism of the search and rescue effort. The search did not begin until nearly five hours after the first 911 call. Because the coordinator was reluctant to interrupt a Christmas dinner at Molly's Restaurant for the annual awards dinner of the Klamath County Search and Rescue Team, before he was certain a rescue was needed. Despite passing polygraph, Robert and Bob were suspected of murdering Derek or having been negligent in some way. Despite his father's insistence, Robert couldn't speak to him. The blame for not finding Derek went to him, but the blame for losing him went to Bob. Engbretson was too overwhelmed with guilt to even think of talking about it. Robert was on leave from work for several weeks. Derek's family spent thousands of dollars looking for him, paying for psychics and a boat to search Klamath Lake. They eventually went bankrupt. The authorities claimed Derek wandered off into the woods and died, and his remains had been scattered by animals. However, the Engbretson family never really believed that, especially since no remains or torn clothing had ever been found. There was a witness who said They'd seen a man and a boy struggling on a highway nearby. Then, in 1999, graffiti was sprawled on a rest area bathroom near Burns, stating that Derek had been killed and buried. It was ruled a hoax by the FBI. A boy named Derek, who was found in Texas under unusual circumstances, looked a lot like Engbretson's son, but was actually a different person. After several days of waiting for confirmation, a bone discovered in Pelican Butte in 2000 was identified as being from a deer. In late 2001, the family mailbox received a handwritten letter. It read, I know who took your son. On July 11, 2000, Frank J. Milligan, a 31-year-old state youth authority worker, approached a 10-year-old boy at a Dallas park and offered him $100 to mow his lawn. In Milligan's car, the man asked the boy, do you want to live or die? Milligan bound the boy's hands with duct tape, then forced him to walk down a dirt road and did unspeakable things to him. Milligan choked the boy and slammed his face into the dirt so hard that he blacked out. 
He then cut the boy's throat and left him for dead. Despite the odds, the boy woke up covered in blood and got to a road, where a passing motorist stopped to help him. During the attack, Milligan was out on bail from the Clatsop County Jail. He ultimately pleaded guilty in both cases after being tracked down by the police. In a letter to police and the Enbretsons, Milligan's cellmate admitted that Milligan had abducted and killed Derek. The letter arrived at the Engbretson's home in late 2001. A detective from the Oregon State Police who investigated the Dallas case confronted Milligan. Derek Milligan confessed to killing him and agreed to lead investigators to his body. The FBI used ground penetrating radar to scan for Derek's bones at Silver Fall State Park, southeast of Salem, where Lori and Robert drove for five hours. There were no results after several days of searching. An assistant district attorney told Engbretson that Milligan had agreed to plead guilty to killing Derek if they spared him the death penalty. However, after Milligan was presented with the paperwork a few days later, he refused to sign it. If the boy fell in the lake, his hatchet was likely to be in the water. It could indicate that the boy had died in the inlet if there was a hatchet in the sediment. Jeff Priest a driver from Portland spent several hours working his way through the shallow water using a metal detector designed for use underwater. An oil filter and a metal road sign were found among the metal objects he found. However, he did not find a hatchet. Was, was Derek Miller abducted by Frank J. Milligan or someone else, as the sheriff believed? Or did he die from a cold or an animal attack? Or... Was Derek Miller taken by something in the woods that sad day in December of 1998? This case is certainly a mystery. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!